afternoon, GS family. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for, uh, for attending. Please visit our you know, air high fives for all users online. Thank you for attending as well. Hold a little closer. And please uh, bow your head with me in prayer. Lord God, thank you for another beautiful day. Thank you for such a, a great and sunny day outside. Uh, please continue to bless us and guide us. Please look after those who were able to attend and those who were unable to, those who are traveling and those who are currently in Ron. Just please continue to bless us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. And amen. You want to do the scripture reading for us, sister? Good morning, GS Fan. Good morning. So uh, I'm going to be doing the readings. So if you want to stand with me. Our text is taken from Psalm 91, 1, 2, 11, and 15. He who dwell in the, in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say, I will say to, to the Lord, Lord my, my refuge and my, my fortress, fortress, my God, my God in, in whom I trust. I trust. For he will command his angel concerning you to guide you in all your ways. When he, when calls, he calls to me, to me I, will I will answer, answer him. him. When you I will be with, with him in trouble. trouble. I will rescue, I rescue him and honor, honor him. him. Amen. Amen.
may be seated. We'll take some announcements here. If you have your bulletin, uh, you can see there on the second page, we have all of our announcements listed there. The Behold Your God series, that is um, for both men and women, because it's just it's the men's Bible study that's sponsoring it. And uh, you can still jump into that. You'll be a little behind, but that's okay. Uh, the blessing of the, of the course continues, so I invite you to that. You can see that we have a catered dinner for 1830 to 1900, then we have the, the study. We do also have the women's Bible study continuing also on Tuesdays at 1830. You can see Miss Armani Phillips about that. We have the Knowing Scripture, How to Interpret. That's on Saturday mornings with breakfast included. And we have the Officer's Fellowship. You can see here we also list our service times for the refuge. And there's always opportunities. And we're always looking for volunteers to help the ministry and worship here. Also wanted to bring your attention to the National Prayer Breakfast. That'll be on the 26th for the, well, actually, it's coming right around the corner, isn't it? At the end of next week, I think it is. Yes, time is flying. Today's the 21st. So that'll be breakfast, breakfast included, and that'll be in the morning, and so we invite you to come to that. And uh, that we are planning for it to be a blessing. That's what we have for our announcements, and then uh, ask our your sister come up for the prayer and for the offering and we have a slide for that as you can see we have many ways you can give you can give through the service or you can give by using the code on your pamphlet So, Father, we want to thank you for what you've done. Thank you for what you've given us. Thank you for everyone that is able to give today. Father, replenish them in hundredfold. Father, we thank you for everything you're doing. We bless your only name. Thank you, Jesus, for we pray in Jesus' name.
grew up on singing that song. I'm very very familiar with that one. Please uh, take your Bibles and turn with me to Matthew chapter 10, excuse me, Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. Give you a moment to get there. We're looking at verses 17 to 19. I've entitled this sermon, Jesus Snatches Victory Out of the Jaws of Defeat. I want to start with some history. 1940. 1940 was a very interesting year. Anybody know what was going on in 1940? That's it. I heard it. World War II. And particularly, I'm focusing in on the blitz bombing of Britain, especially London, by the Nazis' Luftwaffe Air Force. Bombings day in and day out, night in and night out. And during the day, the city covered in rubble and people digging up those that have died underneath the flames and crashing of concrete and block and wood and steel. Their prime minister of the time, Winston Churchill, comes out and starts walking about. He has a smile on his face as he stands there in the midst of just death and destruction. And then he gives what he called a victory speech. And of course, naturally, we might want to kind of scratch our head and say, victory speech? They didn't, Britain had not won anything. In fact, it was looking the opposite. They were being bombed out by the Germans. What is this victory speech for in the middle of attack? Well, of course, its design was to lift the spirits of the average Briton and to increase their resolve to fight. And I want to quote part of his speech. He said this, victory at all costs, victory in spite of all terror, victory however long and hard the road may be, For without victory, there is no survival. That statement reminds me of what's going on here in this passage. And I aim to see that you will see what I am saying to you in Matthew chapter 20, verses 17 to 19. Just before we read it, remember the setting. This is just before the last or final week of Jesus in his earthly ministry. The next Sunday will be what we call Palm Sunday, what the church calendar calls Holy Week. Starts with Palm Sunday on on the first day of the week, and then by Friday, he's being crucified, and he raises resurrects the next Sunday, three days later. So that week there. And this account I'm reading, we're going to read is just before that, just before his triumphal entry with the palms being laid on the ground for him. 2017, and Jesus was going up to Jerusalem. He took the 12 disciples aside, and on the way, he said to them, see, We are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified, and he will be raised on the third day. I'd like to also have you turn back a few pages, probably about three pages or so, to chapter 16. 16, Matthew 16, verses 21 to 23. Uh, A parallel, not of the same occasion, two different occasions, but the same idea. 1621, from that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer 
many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, that this shall, th- this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, for you are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. The reason for reading the parallel passage is to show, first of all, that Jesus kept telling his disciples more than once, you know where I'm going. I'm about to go to Jerusalem, and I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be tried. I'm going to be abused and mistreated and suffer, and they're going to kill me. But I'm going to be raised on the third day. So the disciples knew this was coming. That doesn't mean they always understood it completely, doesn't mean they liked it. We can tell by Peter, they all knew what this meant. That's why Peter draws them aside and says, listen, this is not going to happen. <laughs> but back to our uh, first reading there in, in chapter 20, I just want to point out a few key phrases to build on. It says there in verse 17, Jesus was going up to Jerusalem and he took the 12 disciples aside. And on the way he said to them, He pulled those disciples aside. What is a disciple? A disciple is a follower or a student of Christ. And they were students of Christ, listening and learning from their teacher and their master. They were following him wherever wherever he, he called them. Remember in, earlier in the Gospels, he would go and he saw Simon and Andrew, and he said, follow me, and they just dropped everything and followed him. John and James, follow me, and they dropped everything and followed him, and on he went till they got to 12. And they've been with him all this time, three years now, they've been with him through everything, thick and thin. They have witnessed things that no man has ever seen. And so you can imagine the emotional bond, the physical closeness, the band of brothers idea, staying together, the powerful things that they have witnessed that are miraculous, And then, just when everything seems to be going really well, he pulls them aside and says, listen, when we go into Jerusalem, I'm going to be delivered, condemned, mocked, whipped, and crucified. No wonder Peter had the reaction he had. Peter was just, as is typical for Peter, he's the mouthpiece for everybody. He's the one that tries to step in and say, no, this isn't going to happen. Because they were all thinking, no, no, no. If you claim Christ as your Lord and Savior today, then by definition, you are a disciple. You are a student. You are a follower of Christ. Are you following him? Are you a student? Is he your teacher? Well, for students, we have to be studying. And the book is the Word of God. Are you studying your Bible? Not just the 30-second read it in the morning so you can say you've had some touch with God, but are you really studying it? meditating in it, reading it slowly, thoughtfully, letting it go deep into you? Are you like a sponge soaking up the truth of God's word? And are you really following Jesus with your life? A good question for us to ask ourselves, isn't it? The second thing I want to point out here is in verse 18. He says, see or look or some translations say, behold, We are going up to Jerusalem. We. That means Jesus is saying, me and all of you. And when he says, we are going, and then he says, there's going to be uh, an arrest, a condemnation, a a, a kind of torture, and death and crucifixion. I can imagine them, imagine yourself being like them. You can put this in your mind and say, wait a minute, I've been with him for three years. He is my master. I'm following him. I am a student of his. He's been doing all this miraculous and powerful work. I believe in him. I am am a follower of Christ. By faith, I am trusting in him as the Messiah. Everything's just going along just fine. And then he says, we. And you're thinking, that includes me. So I am going up. 
so wait a minute. If they're going to crucify you, and I'm a follower of you, what are they going to do to... <laughs> right? You're thinking, what are they going to do to me? What's going to happen to me? Am I going to be arrested? Am I going to be flogged? Am I going to be killed? We are going up. And doesn't the Bible tell us as Christians, doesn't God command us to take up our cross and follow him? Even though those men won't take up a physical cross that day, nevertheless, the truth is still there. Jesus is basically saying, just as I am going to the cross, you're coming with me. We're all going to Jerusalem. And he's already told them, think about this, he's already told them in previous chapters, take up your cross and follow me. So I just want you to think about what they might be thinking. Put yourself there as one of them. Saying, okay, he's told us more than once to take up our cross and follow him. And now he's just told us we're all going into Jerusalem and there he will actually end up on a cross for real. There again, you start to say, your heart rate starts to go up a little bit. Perhaps a little bit of sweat starts to build up. And you say, uh, what does this mean for me then? I'm to take up my cross. He's going to the cross. And this is not going to go, we're not going to a party here. So Jesus is going to the cross and this cross. So at the very least, what does this mean for Christians today? You and me right now. Well, I think it means this, first of all. Taking up the cross perhaps is a lot more than you thought it meant <laughs> when maybe you uh, turn to Christ. When somebody comes to Christ, they usually don't know very much about the Lord. Sometimes they do. Maybe they were raised in Christ, never got saved. Then they got saved, and maybe all the learning that they had in church is there. And all kind of like a puzzle starts to fit together more quickly. Some people come to Christ with no Christian background, and everything is brand new. But either way, taking up the cross means hardship. It means there'll be suffering. It means there'll be a mockings. It means there'll be persecution. A Christian life lived as it should means that you are going against the tide. You're going against the, the grain of the culture in the world. And so if the world is in the hands of the devil going one way and you're in the hands of Christ going the opposite way, you know there's going to be friction. So when he says we are going, the same thing is for us. If we say I identify as a Christian, I'm a follower of Christ, he's my Lord and Savior by faith, I've believed in his finished work on the cross and by grace, not by works, he saved me and has given me new life. And now I take up the cross because I'm a disciple, I'm a follower and a student. Think about what is coming your way. And so ask yourself, am, am I taking up my cross? Am I turning away from the world and away from my sinful desires? And we still have them as Christians. We're, we battle with them, right? We progressively are doing battle with them as we become more like Christ. But the battle is still there. You know, the world, the flesh, and the devil, all three are always attacking us, and they're always after us. And as we walk with Christ and we follow him and take up our own cross, do we realize that if life is going so well and we're not having any opposition I think we should actually wonder, am I really walking with Christ? Right? In, in Luke chapter 6, the Bible says, woe to, woe to those when all men speak well of you. For so they did of the uh, false prophets. That's Luke 6, 26. So, um, not that we shouldn't seek a good reputation. 
not that we shouldn't uh, strive to, to be a, a good person, winsome, um, living as Christ would want us to, but there is going to be a clash. There's going to be opposition. It cannot be helped. Again, it's like, it's like you decide to take a swim in a, in a stream. It's going one way, but you need to swim up the other way, the opposite of the flow. That means you're going to be battling your way up. And when Christians step out into this world and even deal with our own emotions, our own desires, which sometimes are not right, we are battling. We're having to die to self and continue to live for Christ. And this is captured here. He says, you guys are going up with me. I'm going to die, but you belong to me and you have identified with me. You have the t-shirt on that says, I belong with Jesus, the one that is now going to go to the cross. Here I am. You're, you're going to face it yourself. So as we move on, we see these key words. Verse 18, the Son of Man will be delivered. Then they will condemn him to death. He will be condemned. It won't be a just condemnation. It will be an unjust one. Why? Because Jesus didn't do anything wrong. He broke no laws. He broke none of God's laws. And he didn't break any uh, of man's laws whenever man's laws were right with God's laws. He broke the Pharisees' rules, but the Pharisees' rules were the traditions of men, not the law of God. So that's fine. They looked for anything they could to get on him. And so uh, it made me think of uh, uh, Galatians 3.13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, curse is everyone who hang hangs, is hanged on a tree, which is a reference to the cross. Christ became a curse for us. He was condemned, not because he was sinful, but he was condemned because we were sinful. He was condemned for me. And for everyone who ever has and ever will call on the name of Christ and be saved, he took the curse for them. That's why he was going to the cross. So when they condemned him, when you read those words and they condemned him, put your name right there. I could read that. And they will condemn him. They will condemn, parenthesis, Jonathan. Jonathan is the reason he was condemned. Jonathan sins, parenthesis. And he will be delivered. But praise God that when I got saved, I then can go to Romans 8, 1. There is now, therefore, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. But he took it. He will be condemned falsely, but intentionally on Jesus' part because he knew this is the way to be able to save people. And then he was delivered, and then he was crucified. He was put to death. For the wages of sin death. is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through, right there in your Bible, Jesus Christ delivered over and crucified there it is. I'd like for you to turn, uh, this is because we, we want to get the richness of it, to Col Colossians, please. Turn to Colossians with me. Some, some verses, you know, can quote and, and it might have its impact, but some you just got to see. So Colossians chapter 2, please turn there with me. Or if you have your phone, use your phone to get there. Colossians chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. A nice description of what actually happened when Christ was crucified on the behalf of all believers. Colossians 2.14 talks about how when he went to the cross, he was canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. So he was canceling a record of debt. That's a reference to the law of God, the law we've broken, you know, like the Ten Commandments, and several other commands of God, laws of God, we've broken that. We all have a rap sheet. We all have a record. 
we are all indebted as guilty of God's law. You know, things like adultery and lust and stealing and coveting and cursing and using God's name in vain and not putting him first in our lives and not worshiping him as he deserves and not obeying our parents and honoring them. The list goes on, and there's not anyone in the room who can say, I haven't done those things. We're all guilty. This is this record of debt. This is the legal demand on us. Sometimes I, I uh, ca- uh, catch this uh, show, uh, I think it's on Facebook, but sometimes I catch it, it's where there's a bounty hunter that goes out and finds people, you know, to collect their bounty. So he comes out there basically with what? A legal demand. He comes out and says, the law is demanding that you come with me because you didn't show up for a court appearance. And so the entertainment part of it is, is he walks into all kinds of situations and has to actually try to get the person. And that's what's happening with every one of us. Because we've broken God's law, there's a legal demand on us from God that says, you have sinned. And the justice of God is, the wages of your sin is death. And death is coming for you. God told Adam and Eve, in the day you eat of this fruit that you're not to eat of, you will surely die. And when they ate of that fruit two things happened. They died spiritually right away, and physically, the clock of death began ticking. And so that's why we, we are born and we grow up, and then we start making our way toward physical death. But uh, unless we turn to Christ, we are continually spiritually dead until he saves us. And so there's this record of debt, but look what it says about it. It says that he canceled it He canceled this record of debt that stood against us with his legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities, and he put them into open shame, and he triumphed over them in himself. This is what he was doing. This is what it means back in our original passage when it says, and deliver him over to be crucified. So there's a death warrant. This is why we need to not only make sure we're right with God through Jesus, but we need to be talking to others about Christ. Because every person has a death warrant hanging over their head. The beautiful thing is is that Jesus' death and resurrection canceled the death warrant. But that only works if you repent and trust in him as Lord and Savior. And then it says, of course, at the end, and he will be raised on the third day. That's victory. That's victory. That's accomplishment. That's where true hope comes from. There is that victory. And uh, it it reminded me as I was preparing for this uh, sermon, my mind went right to uh, this passage from Paul at the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Death has no victory. Death has lost its sting. Death has been swallowed up in the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Praise God for that victory. And knowing what I know now, I could, if I were there... I'm sure I would have that heavy sense of knowing that Christ did not deserve to go through all this and knowing he was doing it for me. And I certainly don't deserve to have him do it for me. But it would crush me to realize I'm watching him go, but he's going not from self, but from me. But I would be so overwhelmed and grateful to think, that last word he uses, he talks about it, right? Delivered, condemned, flogged and mocked, crucified, and then raised. I'm just saying, oh, praise God. He's going to be raised. I will see him again. He will see me again. There's hope. There's life here. There's victory at the end of this. And if I am in Christ, I share in that victory. 
I reap the benefits of the victory of Christ when he raised from the grave. And so the resurrection of Christ does two things. In terms of my position, what category I'm in, it puts me in the category of saved and forgiven and now victorious with him. But it does something else practically for me. It changes my life and my heart, and it gives me personal victory over my own remaining sin, the sin that I still struggle with, the things I'm still dealing with in my own flesh. In the Bible, flesh here means that sinful desires that we sometimes have. But it, I actually have now the power to say no to myself. I have the power to say no to the devil. And I have power to say no to the world. You know, the world's fallen influence that's always in our face and in our ears trying to bring us its way. And, and that reminds me of Romans 6. What a beautiful passage in Romans 6. Let me read it to you, and you're, you're free to follow me there if you turn there. Romans 6, listen to the richness of this. Think about this when we think about him crucified and risen and the battle with sin and the victory God gives us both in position and in practice. Listen to this. Paul says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means, God forbid. How can we who died to sin still live in it. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. I hope you're soaking that up. The death and resurrection of Christ is right there in those 11 verses. And when you can say with a true heart, I am saved, I have been regenerated, I have been forgiven, I have a new heart and a new spirit within me, I belong to Christ, then these verses, Romans 6, 1 through 11, applies to you, and it applies to you, because Jesus said to his disciples, I'm going to Jerusalem, and they're going to deliver me, condemn me, mock me and flog me, crucify me, but I'm going to rise again. Praise God. Praise God. Taking up that cross, what does it mean to take up your cross? means you're going to renounce all rights to the control of your own destiny. You hear that? To renounce means to turn it away, say no to. I renounce all of my, all of my rights to the destiny of my life. I renounce them all. Taking up the cross means you're going to be dying to self and living with and for and through Christ. That's very important. It, it, and it has to happen. Otherwise, you have to look and say, am I really a believer? Because if you are a believer, that has to be happening. And it's kind of like when we joined, ba when we went during the military, right? Went to basic training. In basic training, you, you come in and you make that commitment. And that's the way it is with Christianity. Once you are saved, you have committed yourself to Christ. 
doesn't mean you're going to be perfect, but you've made a commitment to him, and progressively you're going to become more like Christ. A good a model of that is basic training. You go to basic training, and you sign on the dotted line, and you commit yourself to the military. But that doesn't mean you're ready. You've got to go through basic training. And through basic training, what are they doing to you? Progressively molding you and shaping you and training you to look, talk, and be, and sound, and act like an airman, a soldier, a sailor, or a marine. And by the time you get to the end, you have the look, the talk, the walk, the knowledge. So it is with us. When we take up our cross, just like when you joined the military, you gave away a lot of your rights. I will no longer be able to do what I want. I can't grow my hair the way I want. I can't wear any clothes I want to wear any time I want to. I've got to be in a certain amount of shape. I've got to talk a new language. I've got new rules to follow. People are going to tell me where to go. When to go? When somebody takes up the cross, they're saying the same thing. I do not belong to myself anymore. I belong to Christ. Christ is going to tell me what to look like, how to act, where to go, when to go, what to talk about, what to think about, how to behave. This is what it means. I am giving up control of my own destiny. It's that ironic thing of I surrender in order to have victory. You will never have victory unless you surrender to Christ. Another way of looking at it is this. It's like having a t-shirt on that says, under new management. Have you ever been driving by or walking by and you see a company or a business and you see a sign that says, under new management? Something happened before it wasn't, wasn't running right. The business was failing. Something was wrong. And so now someone has turned that business over to new management. Why? To try to make it successful and work as it should. If you are without Christ, you're under old, failing management. Failing. But when somebody turns to Christ by faith, gets saved, they come under new management. Praise God. Are you happy with that? Are you happy to be under new management? I'll tell you what. As I look around at the world, as I look at my own life, as you look at history, I'm so glad I'm under new management. Praise God. Can anybody say amen to that? Are you glad you're, are you under new management? Or are you under the old system where you think you're in control? Praise God. I'm under new management. The Lord's in control. I want to be taking up my cross every morning. And when I look at this passage, as shocking as it may have been to those 12 that he pulled aside and said, listen, let's have a huddle. I want to tell you something. I'm going to Jerusalem, you're going with me, and this is what's going to happen to me. And you remember Peter. Peter's like, whoa, no, 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 we're not, no, Lord, you, you're un, you misunderstood. This is not going to happen. And he has to rebuke Peter. Say, Peter, you don't understand. If I don't do this, the world remains under old management. I have to do this so I can become your Lord and Savior. Be able to be a Savior to all who believe. I need to do this. Because through my surrender comes my victory. Through my crucifixion comes my resurrection. That's the only place where there's hope. You know, one of my favorite hymns goes like this. I'm going to share it with you. Before the throne of God, I have a strong and perfect plea. A great high priest whose name is love, who ever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands. And my name is written on his heart. And I know that while in heaven he stands, and no tongue can bid me thence depart. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and I see him there, the one who made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, 
my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me, to look on Christ and pardon me. I am pardoned because of Christ's crucifixion and resurrection. And I hope that you will be as well. If you're not in Christ, turn to him now. Turn away from your own reliance on yourself and whatever you think you can do, think you can be good enough. No one will be good enough. You need Christ. And I'm happy to talk with you afterwards or later in the week to help you make sure that when you look at this passage, you can actually say, yes, as sad as it was, it had to be done. He had to go through all of that so that I would have hope. And so, back to Winston Churchill. He said, victory at all costs. For us, that was the cross. That was the cost, the cross. He said, victory in spite of all terror and victory however long and hard the road. How long and hard. Remember Jesus said, Lord, if this cup could pass from me, but nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. He knew it was going to be hard. And Churchill says, however long and hard the road, and the road was Calvary for Jesus. Without victory, there is no survival. And we would say, without the crucifixion, there will be no resurrection. And without that victory of a resurrection, there would be no hope for us. Let's pray. Oh, Father God, touch our hearts today. If it is by way of reminder, let us be reminded. If this was something new, I pray that your spirit would work to open eyes to see and ears to hear. Lord God, we thank you that you went to the cross and we thank you that you rose again. You knew where you were going and you took your followers with you. And Lord, anyone in this room now who claims to be your father, follower has to do the same thing. Take up their cross and follow you. Strengthen us to do this, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let us stand to our feet. And I'm going to give uh, a benediction here from the book of Jude. And then as we depart, we will hear that song. Jesus, there's something about that name. Master and Savior, Jesus. So in Jude 24, listen to this encouraging blessing from God to us. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forevermore. Amen. We are dismissed. God bless you all.